So from now on, when I write a theta, this will be a principally polarized abelian variety. Uh, Ag will be the moduli of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. All of this happens over C. Mg uh, is the moduli of curves of genus G. There is a Jacobian map, the Torelli map, Mg to Ag. Uh, the theorem is the Torelli theorem, maybe I write it this way, Jacobian map is an embedding. This is a bit loose because if you're working with stacks, there is some issue here that this has a plus minus one involution, and here the plus minus one involution only exists for hyperelliptic curves. And the way this map defi is defined is a Jacobian of a curve C. Let's say this is peak nod of C, which is isomorphic to peak G minus one of C. And the to choose such an isomorphism, you use that uh, there exists a Riemann vector R such that uh, for any D in peak node of C, the multiplicity of the theta divisor at D is equal to H node of D plus R. This means that R is in peak G minus Okay, uh, maybe I should write H node of C D plus R. So this is a number of sections over the curve C, not over the abelian variety. Okay? And uh, the last thing I proved, so there is a theta divisor, so this is sort of a theta divisor zero, which sits inside here. There is a theta divisor here, which is just the effective ones, okay? And what I proved last time was that I, the theorem, which was Whale's uh, reducibility, which was that for any point P, Q, R, S, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, the curve C, uh, the theta divisor intersect the translate of the theta divisor by P minus Q, so this is translate, sits inside the translate by P minus R, union the translate by S minus Q. Okay? And when writing this, this is a degree zero divisor. So this is valid whether you work here or whether you work here, it doesn't matter. Okay? So the proof I gave, I think, was here, technically speaking, but uh, to give a proof here, you need to add the Riemann vector to everything in the discussion and use this theorem. Okay? So I think now this is hopefully correct. Okay, so this is Whale's reducibility. I want to reformulate it in a different way. So uh, shortly today we'll have a definition of the theta function, and I'll be able to write uh, the formulas, but let me introduce notation for it without writing the formula, and then I'll say what happens here. So theta function is the unique section, is the unique up to a constant multiple section of theta. So I'll write theta of tau z, which will be a complex number. So tau here will be an element of the Ziegel upper half space, which is, recall, the universal cover of the moduli space for abelian varieties. And z will be in C to the g, which is the universal cover of a fixed abelian variety. So theta function is a map like that, okay? 
I'll write a formula for it shortly, but for now I just want to emphasize that we can think of it as a, uh, on a given abelian variety, we have a section of the line bundle. We can lift this section of a line bundle to the universal cover of the abelian variety. So it will satisfy certain transformation rules. So it means if you take uh, the value of theta, uh, not at some point of c to the g, but at the point of c to the g plus some lattice vector, lattice means in the z to the g plus z to the g times tau lattice, there will be a certain transformation rule. And presumably, say, we can also uh, try to lift it to the Ziegel universal upper half space, Ziegel upper half space, which is the universal cover of the Moiseley space for billion varieties. And this will have certain transformation rules here, okay? But j this is just the way I'm going to write it. And sometimes when I'm only working on one abelian variety, I'll drop the tau, okay? So let's look at this here. Let's look at this reducibility and let's try to translate this in a bit more analytic way. So what does this mean? So what is, on the right-hand side, we have a union of two divisors. So how can we write down a function that vanishes on this? So try to interpret this. as an equality of functions on C to the G. So we're just working on one abelian variety, so I fix the abelian variety, and I think of this as an equality of functions on C to the G. So the right-hand side, well, this is just the zero locus of theta, the zero locus, as of a function in z. Uh, of theta of z plus p minus r times theta of z plus s minus q, right? So what is this? The theta function, its zero locus, is by definition the theta divisor. Right? That's how we, this is a unique section of the line bundle. If I now translate the argument, this amounts to translating the bundle. Right? And I translate it by p minus r. So here, you should think of p minus r as a point in uh, c to the g, or at least in a point in the abelian variety. Okay? Okay. So that's the right-hand side. And the right-hand side has to contain the left-hand side. So what do we see on the left-hand side? So on the left-hand side, so on the left-hand side, we'll certainly have theta of z, and we have theta of z plus p minus q, right? And what does this uh, equality tell us? Uh, what does this inclusion, sorry, tell us? It tells us that if we're in the intersections, then we're in the union, which means that uh, so if both of these vanish, so then this thing has to vanish. Right? That's what this tells us, that if we have this function vanish and this function vanish, then this product vanishes. Okay? So how can this happen? Well, in particular, this would happen this would be implied if we had something like that theta of z times a of z plus theta of z plus p minus q times b of z is equal to theta of z plus p minus r theta of z plus s minus q. So if we had an equality like that, the vanishing of this and of that would imply the vanishing of the right-hand side. Okay? I mean, I, I realize this is a bit ad hoc, maybe, but then somehow we have to interpret this, right? And sort of the, uh, the, the way you can write an equality that would imply this is this, right? So if this is true, so this if you look at this, this is, a section, this is a section of a certain line bundle. So this is a section on the abelian variety of the line bundle 2 theta 
shifted by P plus S minus R minus Q, right? Because this is a section of theta shifted by P minus R. This is a section of theta shifted by S minus Q. So for such an equality to make some sense, I mean, we're writing it on C to the G, the left-hand side better be the section of the same line bundle. So this object is a section of theta. So thus, this part is a section of, well, that minus Z of theta P plus S minus R minus Q. OK? And this is a section of theta. Well, it takes this, subtract that. So the translation by P minus Q disappears. You're left with the translation by S minus R. OK? Uh, so uh, technically, all I want to claim is the following, that if we have an identity of the following form, theta of z, theta, oh, sorry, uh, let's, let's write a here. So this is now a constant in c. So I mean, it's a number, right? Because we're all the dependence on z we have already included in this. Okay. So what happened here? I said that we would expect this A of Z to be a section of a translate of the theta divisor by this. But that's a translate of the theta divisor. The theta divisor had only one section. So its translate will also have only one section. What is the section? Well, you just translate the theta function by that. And then there is a coefficient A here, which does not depend anymore on this, right? So essentially, I'm trying to argue that this is equivalent to this for some constants A and B. Okay, But let's not worry too much about that. So such an equality certainly implies the equality above. And this certainly implies uh, reducibility. Right? So reducibility being this statement. Right? So this means the moment I have this, I know that the intersection of these two theta divisors with the translates will be contained in this intersection. OK? Uh, in, uh, there is a fact that you want to prove. Uh, if you want to prove it, you'll need to use something about Kozul cohomology. You'll need to say some somewhat more sophisticated words that uh, the reducibility star is, in fact, equivalent to this identity. I mean, identity meaning this is true for all z. Okay? So even though I was trying to do something a bit ad hoc, it turns out that, in fact, if you have such a reducibility, it, it implies that there will be such an identity. It's very easy to see the implication from here to reducibility. The opposite is also true. So the, the going from here to here, you know, hopefully I'll convince you, is reasonably clear. Why such a thing has to happen for such reducibility to happen, you need to say something about causal cohomology. Okay? So you just, you just do it. Okay. I, I don't want to dwell on that, because uh, in a way, you can prove this directly. For, so I gave an algebraic proof of this. There is a proof of this as well, directly. And you can compute A and B explicitly. Okay. So. That's somehow an identity for the theta function for Jacobians. So it means that if you take a Jacobian of a Riemann surface and you take four points P, Q, R, and S in it, you'll have such an identity. Okay. So if you look at it, this is an identity for certain sections of two theta shifted by you know, P plus S minus R minus Q. So let's look at the sections of two theta. So let me uh, take a step back. Let's forget about Jacobians for a second. So uh, interlude. 
uh, sections and properties of n theta on a principally polarized abelian variety. Okay? We'll come back to this and we'll use it in a second, but I want to do, discuss this for a second. So, notice that if you have a principally polarized abelian variety, the principally polarized part means this, right? Okay? And, uh, by the way, if you were to consider higher homologies, they are, of course, all zero, because they are homologies of some sample. Okay? So, thus, if you wanted to compute the dimension of the space of sections of n theta, the n stands the power of a bundle, right? This is going to be the same as the Euler characteristic of one A of n theta, because there are no higher homologies either. This bundle is still ample uh, for any n greater than or equal to one, right? Okay, any n integer greater than or equal to one. But this you can compute, and uh, this is in fact equal to n to the g. Okay. You, uh, if you want, let's accept this as a fact. I'll construct the sections by hand anyway. We, all, we will not care about general n. Okay, so there are n to the g sections of this thing. And this means that you may have a more interesting geometry. So if you have just one section, there is not so much you can do with it. Now we have a large dimensional space of sections. And you can ask what properties does it have. So there is a theorem due to Lefschetz, or at least it's called Lefschetz theorem, which is the following, which is to say that uh, the bond 2 theta is very ample on the quotient of the abelian variety by plus minus one involution and n theta is very ample on A for any n greater than or equal to three. Okay? So let me indicate a proof of this. It will not be a complete proof. So let's concentrate on the case of two theta. Okay? So for a proof, we'll use the following fact. Uh, well, well, we'll use the fact, use the following idea. So we do the we do this part. Do the case of two theta. Okay. So what are we going to? do. We're going to just try to construct sections of 2 theta, right? So, I mean, we compute the dimension is 2 to the g, but now the question is how do we write one? The idea is as follows. So, for any uh, point A in the abelian variety A, you see that uh, if you take theta function of z plus A times the theta function of z minus A, that's going to be a section on the abelian variety of the bundle, you know, theta translated by A plus theta translated by minus A, right? But then the shifts will cancel. So this is the same as a section of 2 theta. Okay. So we now have a large a g dimensional family of sections of 2 theta. In fact, this g-dimensional family linearly spans the space of sections of 2 theta. I mean, this is not a linear family, right? It's not a g-dimensional space, okay? So now what I want to show is I want to show that 2 theta is very ample. So I'll need to take two points, and I'll need to show that sections of 2 theta separate those two points. So given, so to show very ampleness of 2 theta, on the quotient by plus minus one, we need the following. Given any points, uh, say z1, z2, in the abelian variety, z1 not equal to plus or minus z2, uh, we'll find an f in two theta 
such that it vanishes at one and not at the other. Okay. So how we're going to do this? We're just going to try to use one of these guys. So let us consider consider the set. the set of all A such that the theta of Z1 plus A times the theta of Z1 minus A is equal to zero. Okay? So this is just a set of all functions of this form which will vanish on the at Z1. Right? But what does this mean? This is the same I mean, this is the theta divisor translated by z1, right? Because when does this vanish? When one of the two factors vanishes. So either this is zero or that is zero. So this is the theta divisor translated by z1, and the theta function is even because we chose an asymmetric theta divisor. So this is this union, the theta divisor translated by minus z1. Okay? So now, so if for any a, in this set, uh, sorry, minus z1, we have also theta of z2 plus a times theta z2 minus a is zero, right? Then we must have what? Then Then we must have theta divisor, sorry, z1 union theta divisor minus z1 must be contained in the theta divisor, z2 union theta divisor minus z2, right? Okay? So if the theta divisor is irreducible, this implies that this piece will can be contained in one of these two. Then theta z1 is equal to theta z2 then, or theta z1 is equal to theta minus z2, right? But here we have a section theta of z plus z1. Here we have a section theta of z plus z2. They must be the same thing. So th this implies z1 is equal to z2. This implies z1 is equal to minus z2. Okay? And if theta divisor is reducible, I mean, we need more work. Okay, which I don't want to show right now. Okay. But it, it's, still ho it's still okay. There is some further problem that you know, I said very ample. I didn't say it defines an, that this map defines an embedding for which I would need to check the rank of the differential. And the rank of the differential is okay for irreducible abelian varieties, but not okay for non-irreducible. Okay? So let me then define. Uh, so I won't do the case of uh, higher multiples of theta. So in that case, you can imagine Instead of taking a product of two translates of the theta device, I'll take a product of, you know, three translates of theta, so that the sum of the translates will be zero as a point of the abelian variety. And it will work. So now let me define the Kuma image. Of A theta is the image of the abelian variety quotient by plus minus one in the projective space of dimension two to the g minus one under the linear system two theta. So let me explain what this means. So uh, given a basis which shall denote theta epsilon for epsilon line in z mod 2 to the g. So this is just notation for a basis of 2 theta. 
So, I mean, I will, uh, this is not a random notation. I will actually define what these things are. But this is a notation I will use for a chosen nice basis of two theta that I will particularly like for some reason. And the numbering is such that you see there are exactly two to the g different uh, elements of this basis, which is the correct number. So this is some basis that is a specific basis I'll show to you when we're talking about the theory analytically. But let's say there is a basis. So the Kummer map is the following map. So Kummer, it takes a plus minus 1. In the projective space, it's mentioned 2 to the g minus 1 by just taking a point z to the set of values of this of these functions. Okay. So this is my notation. And the image of the Kummer map is the Kummer image of an abelian variety. Okay. So this is uh, just a matter of notations. Okay. Now, there, re there is a reason why I wanted this, but uh, are there any questions first? So we take the map given by the full linear system 2 theta, if you wish, or more, pre or more concretely, we choose a basis for sections of 2 theta. We consider a map sending a point to the values of this basis at this point. There are 2 to the g of this basis elements, so you'll get a map to a projective space of dimension 1 less. Okay? And I, sh I showed here, almost, so this is an injective map. It's a reasonably nice map. Okay. So remember, we also had an isogeny theorem. Or well, we had some indication of an isogeny theorem last time. Uh, so a special case was the following. We said that if we take A cross A and map it to A cross A by sending a pair x, y to x plus y, x minus y, and let's call this map P. Then we said that if we were to take the pullback of theta cross theta, this will be 2 theta cross 2 theta. Okay? So what does this really mean in the more analytic language? So this means if we take any section of this, it will pull back to a certain section of this. Likely for us, or maybe unlikely, I don't know, there is only one sort of section you can really, really take here because theta has one section and theta has one section. So this means if we take a product of theta functions, so this means the following, that if you were to take theta of x plus y, as the theta function on the f first argument pulled back, and you take the theta on the second argument, theta x minus y pulled back, this is supposed to be, as a function of x, it's a section of 2 theta. Well, no surprise there. I mean, as a function of x, it's a section of theta translated by y and of theta translated by minus y. So, of course, it's a section of 2 theta as a function of x. As a function of y, so uh, this is also a section of 2 theta because the theta is even. You can switch this around. So this is a translate by x. This is a translate by minus x, right? So somehow this theorem is not really so useful because, I mean, we can look at this expression and we can immediately see this is a section of 2 theta as a function of x and a section of 2 theta as a function of y. But what, this actually, uh, what actually happens is that for this basis, for this basis that I like that I'll tell you about, this is equal to a sum of theta epsilon of x times theta epsilon of y the sum of all epsilons in z mod 2 to the g. So you can say that this basis is sort of adapted to this theorem in the sense that that's the formula you get. Okay? And this is known as Riemann's bilinear relation. I'm not proving it now because I haven't really told you what these guys are. I will tell you what they are, then it will be an easy exercise that I would encourage you to do to prove this theorem. 
But I wanted to give the theorem now to, to show that the moment you believe this, you start seeing interesting geometry of the Kuma image of the Kuma variety. Okay? So let's believe this. So now recall that here, before I erased, so this is say head of the interlude. Okay. So let's get back to Jacobians. So recall that we have that for Jacobian, that for any point P, Q, R, S on a curve C, we know we have a some number a times theta of z times theta of z plus p plus r minus s. Uh, I forget now whether it was probably like that. Plus b theta of z plus p minus q theta of z plus s minus r was equal to theta of z plus p minus uh, the one I did not subtract yet, theta of z plus s minus q, right? This was our reformulation of Weyl's reducibility, okay? Uh, and this was true for any z on the Jacobian of c, okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's take this thing and let's apply it. So use Riemann's bilinear relation. So let's try to see what happens here. So this is, of course, a section of 2z shifted by something. So it's not very surprising he would be able to write it down in terms of a basis of 2 theta. The shift, you know, just gets carried through. So that's the case. So let's try to see what happens. So for, to use it, you know, if we have, a, we have a bunch of products of 2 theta functions, so we need to write the arguments as, you know, x plus y and x minus y. So let me maybe rewrite the Riemann's bilinear relation as saying that theta of sort of z1, theta of z2 is equal to the sum of theta epsilon of z1 plus z2 over 2, theta epsilon of z1 minus z2 over 2. And of course, the moment I'm writing over 2 on an abelian variety, you should object that there are many different ways you can divide over 2. You can add a point of order 2, sort of arbitrarily. But uh, let me view this as an identity for functions on C to the G. So that's reasonably safe. Let's not I'm trying to say let's not worry about it so much. So uh, I mean, this is just, uh, you know, if I re denote x plus y z1 and x minus y z2, then x is the half sum of these things and y is the half difference. Okay. So let's apply it here. So what do we get? Well, the number a is a number. It's not, nothing is going to happen to it. Now, here, of course, we're going to get a sum of all epsilon. And I'll stop writing epsilon is in z mod 2 to the g, but I'll stop writing where epsilon is. It's the sum of all epsilon. OK? So now this is a product of two things. So we're supposed to be getting theta epsilon of half sum. So what's half sum? Well, z appears twice, so it will be z plus p plus s minus r minus q over 2. Then there will be theta epsilon of half difference. So half difference uh, is z uh, gets subtracted, and the half difference is p plus s minus r minus q over 2. So one thing I didn't mention, and I should have mentioned, and somehow here implicitly, these functions are defined on a quotient by plus minus 1. So as functions of z, these guys are all even. Right? So I can change the sign. OK? So this plus the next term, b times the sum over epsilon of theta epsilon. And now you take the half sum of these things. So the half sum will be the same, actually, which should not surprise you because we wrote this formula by knowing they're all sections of the same bundle, 2 theta plus this thing. So the sum is always the same. Theta epsilon of half difference, which I'll now have to compute a bit more carefully. So it's going to be 
P plus R minus Q minus S over 2. Okay? I'm allowed to flip the sign here, but I'm just writing it in such a way that P appears with a plus. It's my choice. Okay? And this is going to be equal to the other side. So again, there is a sum over epsilon of theta epsilon of half sum, which is again the same because, I mean, they're all sections of the same bundle as a function of z. And now there'll be a different half difference here. So I want the p to appear with a plus, and it will be over 2. And let's look up here. So it's p minus r minus this thing. So plus q minus s over 2. OK? And this has to be valid for all z in the Jacobian of c, or all z in c to the g, if you wish. OK? I didn't do anything to the formula. I just you know, rewrote it by noticing that all of these things, are section, as functions of z, are sections of 2 theta with a translate. Then I have a choice, this choice, for the basis of sections of 2 theta. The translate just you know, gets put in here. So I just wrote it in terms of the basis, right? So this is an identity. So this is an identity of the kind, the sum of epsilon of theta epsilon of z plus p plus s minus r minus q over 2 times some coefficient, I don't know, let's call it c epsilon, which is independent of z. is identically equal to 0 in z, right? That's the identity we have. If I move everything to one side, I bring the similar terms together, that's what I get. Okay? Well, but, but these are basis of sections. Well, if you wish with a shift, are a basis for the sections of the two theta bundle with the corresponding shift. Right? So thus, if you want to have this, It's equivalent to the, all the coefficients being zero, right? Because it's a linear combination of the basis of sections being zero, so all the coefficients of the basis elements have to be zero. Okay, questions? Okay, so let's write out what these basis coefficients are. So this means so thus so we get then the following we get for any epsilon the theta epsilon of this thing times a plus the theta oops the capital theta so this is a capital theta modulo my bad handwriting and that's what it should be P plus R minus Q minus S minus 2 times B minus theta epsilon of uh, the last thing, P minus R plus Q minus S over 2 is 0. Okay? So what does this mean? We have a map, remember, Coomer map, which takes an abelian variety quotient by plus minus 1 into the projective space. So this is equivalent to saying that the Coomer images of P plus S minus R minus Q over 2, Coomer image of P plus R minus Q minus S, and the Coomer image of P minus R plus Q minus S over 2 are linearly dependent. Right? 
right? Because the coefficients a and b I can choose arbitrarily. So this means that there are three points in the projective space of dimension 2 to the g minus 1 that are linearly dependent, which means they lie on a line. Right? So if I wanted to write this sort of as an equation, I'll put wedge products here and I'll write this as a 0. Right? This being considered as points in c to the 2g or in p to the, to the g minus 1. Okay. So this means, so thus, for any curve C, the Jacobian, the Kuma image of a Jacobian, of the, of the Z Jacobian of the curve C, has a four-dimensional family of tri-secant lines. Right, because it's a line that intersects the Kuma image in three points. Okay. So now let's try to think about whether this should be surprising or not. So let's think about it. So let's say the genus G is very, very large. So if genus G is very large, I mean the Kuma image is a G-dimensional sub-variety of a 2 to the G minus 1 dimensional space. Right? So how do we try to find out whether it's likely to have trisecant lines or not? So let's take, so how do we find out if there is a trisecant line? Well, if there is a point for any two lines. The condition is for lines for some two points to intersect the variety in some third point. So we take two points in the variety, that means two g parameters. We draw a line through them, that means one extra parameter. So that's two g plus one. And then we ask for this to intersect in the third point. So there is a two g plus one dimensional set of sort of secant lines, and we're asking for it to intersect the Kumar image, the g dimensional thing, in another point. And then two to the g dimensional space, this is extremely unlikely, because our dimension of our space is so small. So it means somehow that the Kuma images of Jacobians are extremely special sub-varieties of the projective space. So the question you can then ask is the following. Is this characteristic of Jacobians? So what do I mean? So recall that there is a following problem called the Schottky problem. Which is characterized the image of the Torelli map. Okay? And you can uh, and this question asks whether this image is characterized by the property of the Kuma image having a trisecant line. So let me tell you that there are some results on the Schottky problem. There is in particular one important result that I'd like to tell you about. There is a theorem due to Matsusaka and Ron. which is the following. Uh, a principally polarized abelian variety, a theta, is the is a Jacobian, is a Jacobian, is a Jacobian, if and only if there exists a curve inside A such that in homology the class of this curve is equal to the G minus first intersection of the theta divider divided by G minus one factorial. Okay. Uh, 
uh, I would also like to remark that if we were to compute the intersection number, the top intersection number of theta is g factorial. So this is sort of the minimal integral class. So this is the minimal class. Okay. So this is the result I just want to state here without any discussion thereof. So uh, one way is not so hard. So if you have an actual Jacobian, you take your curve and you map it to your Jacobian, right, by taking the double Jacobian map. So you choose some point as a basis, and you just map any point of the difference of that point and the starting point of the map. And then you verify that you indeed have this class in homology. Okay? But notice uh, this result, I mean, gives the solution of the Schottky problem. It characterizes. Jacobians of curves among principally polarized abelian varieties. Now, suppose you were to try to use to use it. Suppose I were to give you an abelian variety, and I were to ask you whether it is actually a Jacobian of some curve. How are you going to apply it? Well, you will need to find out or prove that there isn't such a curve of the minimal homology class. So you need to construct a curve within an abelian variety. Well, how do you construct a curve within a variety? Well, the simplest way is you just take a divisor, and you take another divisor, and you keep intersecting. But well, then, of course, you get a complete intersection. On a generic abelian variety, the only divisor you have is theta. And of course, if you take g minus 1 copies of theta and intersect them with translates or whatnot, uh, you're going to get the class theta to the g minus 1 without g minus 1 factorial. So you're going to be very, very far. So this curve that you have here is certainly not going to be a complete intersection. And then it's absolutely not clear at all how on earth you're going to construct such a curve. So using this criteria, to actually check whether specifically given a billion variety is a Jacobian or not is not an easy business. I mean, there is no direct approach. But this is somehow a very useful result to prove other characterizations. So in particular, I wanted, obviously, to bring the tri-sequence into the picture. So there is a theorem uh, due to Gunning. And by the way, uh, this is called phase tri-sequence formula. Uh, I think it was first discovered by Gunning, so let me call it phase Gunning's second formula. So hopefully I don't have stars here, so let's call this a star. Okay. And the theorem due to Gunning is the following. If for a, a principally polarized abelian variety A theta, there is some very mild general position assumption that I won't write down. There exists a one-dimensional family of points P in A such that uh, this condition holds, such that for this one-dimensional family of P, you have a corresponding trisecant so such that for some fixed Q, R, S, and A. So you fix three points, and then you allow the fourth point to vary. So we have a one-dimensional family of trisecants. Then A theta is a Jacobian. Okay. So this is the solution of the Schottky problem again. How would you prove this? I'm not going to give a proof. Well, the proof is going to be as follows. So you have a one-dimensional family of P satisfying this trisecant condition. Then you would want to prove that this one, well, this one-dimensional family means you'll have a curve. So you'll need to check that this curve, in fact, has the minimal class. That turns out to be possible with some work. So you prove that if you have a one-dimensional family of P such as this holds, then uh, the curve of such P will, in fact, have the minimal class, and you apply the matsusaka run criterion. Now, suppose, again, you were to be given a principally polarized abelian variety, and I were to ask you to try to use this to verify whether it's Jacobian or not. You essentially will have to come up with a curve again, because you'll have to find a curve, right? 
And there is a weaker version of the Schottky problem, which is the following. Given an abelian variety and the curve, verify whether this abelian variety is a Jacobian of this curve. That's, of course, much easier than asking whether this abelian variety is a Jacobian of some curves that you don't know. Okay? So this sort of solves this easier version in a way that if you have such a curve, then you can do that. Okay? So that's a theorem that I don't want to uh, give a proof of, but I mean it goes by reduction to this and uh, this you need to, to prove. Uh, the reason I don't want to give a proof is you can ask a much stronger question, uh, and this was conjectured, and this was in the 80s. Okay, and this was also in the 80s. And there was a conjecture also made by Welters in the 80s which then was, became a theorem due to Kritschewer in 2007, 6, 7, depending on what you count, okay? Which is the following. If the Kuma image of some abelian variety A admits a trisecant line, And let me say here, or the degenerate trisecant line, I'll explain in a second what this means. Then A is a Jacobian. In all of these considerations, points of order 2 play a somewhat special role because they're single on the Kuma image, so the trisecant line should not go through points of order 2. But let me not say this. Okay? Uh, I'll explain in a second what the degenerate trisecant is, but let me first emphasize this is a much stronger result, right? Because here uh, you start with a trisecant line. So you have an abelian variety, you have the Kuma image, you have three points on it. There is no curve in the picture, nowhere near. At least the way, I mean, the moment you look at it, you don't see the curve. But somehow it tells you that if you have a trisecant line, all of a sudden, you'll be able to have a four-dimensional family of trisecant lines, or at least, you know, a one-dimensional family of translates of this trisecant line that will somehow come out of the structure of the abelian variety in a natural way. There are no further assumptions. I mean, the trisecant line does not go through points of order to find. That's all you need to ask. So it should be an honest trisecant line. And uh, the goal of, you know, the following five hours will be to sort of give a proof of this and of some other version of that. So let me say now what a degenerate trisecant is. So you see, I mean, I'll draw a picture because that's probably the best I can do. So what is a trisecant? This is actually useful to motivate what we're going to start doing shortly. So here is a picture of a trisecant, right? I mean, of course, it happens in many dimensions, but that's my best attempt at drawing a trisecant, right? So this is an actual trisecant. It has three points of trisecancy. So you can degenerate it. I mean, we have a large family, right? So in this family, you can degenerate. You can, say, bring uh, points P and R together, right? So two of these points will, if P becomes equal to R, two of these points will become the same, this one and this one, right? The sign you can change, okay? So if you degenerate, this means you move the trisecant around, and if you have this, this means eventually you'll have this. So this will be a line tangent uh, to the Kummer image at one point. And intersecting it at another point. Okay. And you can ask whether that they exist, and this thing certainly exists for Jacobians because you just take this degeneration here and this is exactly what's going to happen, and we'll do that a bit more carefully. And you can ask whether this characterizes Jacobians, and in fact it does. So if you have one line like that, it characterizes Jacobians. Then you can degenerate some more. So now you can bring these two points together, so this corresponds to one other of these points collapsing. Okay. And what you'll get eventually, you'll get this picture. You'll get, uh, this will be a flex line. So that a line tangent to, order, to the next order, to order 3. 
to order. I, don't, I mean, I don't, it depends on how you count orders, whether it's order two or three. Order three at the point. Uh, so maybe a line intersection the Kuma image of A with multiplicity three. And you can ask whether such a condition will characterize Jacobians among all principal of polarized abelian varieties. And the answer is yes. And if you look at this one now, what this means is this is some condition on the uh, Kuma image and the derivatives of the Kuma image at that point, right? That they all lie on the line. So it will be somehow linear. The linear dependence of the Kuma image is derivative and its second derivative, or things like that. I and mean, we'll have to work out a bit more carefully what this is. But the point is, this is now some differential condition. So this is where you see that there are some differential equations for the Kuma image that will turn out to be useful for the theta function. And uh, the purpose of much of this further lectures will be to discuss these differential conditions. But I think before we do that, I will define properly the theta function analytically. I'll write down a formula. I'll prove some of the things. I, mean, I, I will show. Uh, some of the things, how you can prove some things I haven't proven yet. We'll discuss the theory of theta functions, sort of identities between theta functions, theta constants, and so on. And I'll do that. Before that, uh, so that will be the next hour. In the remaining couple of minutes, I just wanted to say the following. So let's uh, consider the Schottky problem for a second. So the dimension of mg is equal to 3g minus 3. The dimension of ag so this is the moduli of curve. This is the dimension of the principal, moduli of principal of polarized abelian varieties. This is g times g plus 1 over 2. So if I wanted to somehow try to understand in which dimensions, in which genera, in, for which g, this problem is interesting, let me draw, uh, write down a table. And let me also write here 2 to the g minus 1, which will somehow be useful for the further study. So for 1, we have 1 and 1 here. I know this is not 3g minus 3, but let's not worry. For 2, I have 3, 3, 3. For 3, I'll have 6, 6, 7. For 4, I'll have, let me write 4, 5, and so on. So here I'll have 9, 10, 12, 15, and this is going to be huge, okay? So this line, just keep in mind, because it will appear in what we're going to discuss shortly. And this, of course, is the dimension of the Kuma image, but this is also the dimension of the uh, space in which theta constants map. So this somehow will turn out to be useful, or if you wish this, whatever. So in genus 1, 2, and 3, the dimension of the Moiseley F curves is the same as the dimension of the Moiseley F principle of polarized abelian varieties. And in fact, for genus up to three, I mean, so, so there is no Schottky problem. You know, the, any abelian variety that is irreducible is a Jacobian of a smooth curve. Any reducible abelian variety, reducible means it's a product of lower dimensional ones, is a Jacobian of, of a bouquet of a couple of smooth curves. So there is really no Schottky problem. In genus four, I mean, there is a co-dimension one locus in the Moiseley space of principle of polarized abelian varieties of dimension four. Okay, and uh, sort of here is a solution to the Schottky problem, right? You can try to apply it and do it explicitly in genus four. It's going to be very hard. I don't know a, a direct way to use it in genus four. So if I were to actually write down here on a blackboard a four by four complex symmetric matrix with positive definite imaginary part, and I were to ask you to try to use this to verify whether or not it is a Jacobian, it's going to involve a lot of work on your part. And it's not clear how you're going to do it, because you need to find out whether there exist three points that form a tricycle. And that's not so easy. But there is a very nice explicit solution in genus 4 for the Schottky problem that I'll tell you in the next hour. In genus 5, there is really no explicit solution. So if I were to uh, write down a 5 by 5 matrix, uh, it's going to be very very hard for you to tell me whether it's a Jacobian or not. So if no very explicit solution is known. There are some equations known, but then that 
cut out the Jacobian locus, the M5 with an A5, as an irreducible component, but that's all is known, and the equations are extremely ugly to write down. So the problem is somehow still open in the sense that if I were to actually write the matrix and ask you whether it's a Jacobian or something, you wouldn't be able to do it necessarily. But I think this is probably the best solution of the problem. Uh, you can also ask uh, whether you can uh, use similar techniques to study more general abelian varieties. And time permitting, at some point I will start discussing prime varieties and in general the open questions in the field and multiplicities of the theta divisor. But that will probably come at the end of the course. So I think now we should break for lunch, and in the next hour, I'll develop the theory of the theta function. Thank you for listening. <laughs>